It's an interesting task to discuss about the epidemiology of hepatitis B in Central Eastern Europe due to the fact that uh, WHO mentioned that one in 50 people is touched by hepatitis C and one in 50 people is touched also by hepatitis B. So uh, if right now we have a therapy for hepatitis C, for hepatitis B, we can only stop the replication and maintain the course of the uh, patient till we gain a new medication to can clear the viruses. So WHO is very clear from this point of view, and he mentioned that more than one million people is affected by hepatitis B and C, and unfortunately, many of those people have no idea they are infected neither by hepatitis C or by hepatitis B. So in 2013, 29 million people in Europe, Union, were suffering from a chronic liver uh, condition. And of course, this chronic liver condition is associated frequently with sclerosis and of course with hepatocarcinoma. So the figures are very important for us because this gain us the idea how important um, this plague is. So we discuss in this very moment about 240 million people which are chronically infected with hepatitis B. And of course, from those, we discuss also about occupational hazard for health workers. We are health workers, and I presume that everybody in this room is also vaccinated against hepatitis B. And however, this can be preventable by current available safe and effective vaccination. Unfortunately, in uh, last years, we had an important campaign in social media, which is against the vaccination. And uh, we have to do our efforts to empower the vaccination campaign in our countries. So if we are looking to the European region, it is estimated that 13 million people have chronic hepatitis B, and 1 million Americans have also hepatitis B. And from those 30 million people affected by hepatitis B, we have an estimation that or more than 36,000 people every year in Europe. So it's a lot of people which are affected by this uh, infections and of course with a lot of uh, problems. We may see the distribution all over the world and we see that we have a high rate of uh, chronic infections also in uh, Amazon. So if you like to go there in a trip, you have to pay attention to the possible infections with um, hepatitis uh, B, due to the fact that uh, Jonathan mentioned that uh, the guy that uh, was in the case uh, was not dipping in the same bed uh, every night. So in Amazon, you may have be at risk from this point of uh, view. We have to look to the charts. And if we are looking to the charts between the five and nine years old in 2005, we see that a lot of components in the region are affected by hepatitis B. Yeah. But if we go further and to see what's going to happen between 19 and 49 years old, practically we have the same uh, scheme, so we have to be aware. Globally, the printed paper mentioned that uh, in 2005, compared in, in the 1990, the number of patients we increase, increased with 17 million people in hepatitis B. 17 million people, it's almost uh, people in Romania. So one country in this interval of time with uh, being affected newly by hepatitis B virus. And of course, we have to know exactly in comparison to its life expectancy. If you are living in a rich country, now you have a life expectancy more than 80. If you are going to this region, you decrease less than 75 years old. And of course, it's not all. So it depends where you're living and how you may gain years for extra life. This doesn't mean that you have to move from one country to another to gain life expectancy. The problem is, yeah, the problem is to increase the local security uh, from the sanitation point of view. Uh, but if you die, you die. Doesn't matter where you die. Doesn't matter if you die in uh, welfare countries, where in uh, low-income countries. But it's important to do not die due to the chronic infection with hepatitis B, with cirrhosis, or with hepatocarcinoma. 
And in this situation, the blue is good. It's not a blue situation. It's just the color uh, which you mentioned the um, uh, cause of mortalities. And you see in this area, the cause of mortality is less uh, agglomerated uh, compared with this area when the standardization of this is increasing considerable. We are looking to the male female. It's not a big difference. It may be a little bit, a little bit higher. But in general, we discuss about the same things. But we are looking specifically to the digestive system. We see that there's not any difference between 1990 and 2009. That means that progression we've done in this period of time are not directly reflected in this uh, epidemiological effect. But the cancer is there. And unfortunately, the hepatocarcinoma is in top 10 cancer. So uh, it's a reason why we have to unite our efforts to reduce the incidence of Hep B and Hep C in the world. In the last 20 years, we saw that the hepatitis, the chronic liver diseases, and cirrhosis represent more than half for total digestive uh, problems. So uh, due to all the efforts that we have done, we are still in this area. And of course, it's a direct link between hepatitis and the mortality, as is mentioned in this uh, chart. Unfortunately, we have another problem in Central East Europe. We have a smoking area, and the smokers are very well represented, as you may see in this chart. Fortunately, the ladies started to renounce to smoking. The males are still heavy smokers, and if we add also a little bit alcohol, yeah, then the things might be more complicated. And we know that those two factors, that means alcohol, the smokers, are one of the two important factors affecting the HIV um, um, evolution and uh, represent risk factor for this uh, kind of infections. Here is Romania, and you see that Romania is in a pole position, I may, I, I may say like this, from the point of view of alcohol consumption. Do money matter? Of course it matters. It matters for this conference, it matters for the future, it matters for the pharma, it matters for everybody. But uh, the fact that this money matter split the countries between high-income countries and low-income countries, and here we have more than 22 countries with low income. From this point of view, any good negotiations with the pharma for the good medication important represent an important step in the therapy of those uh, patients. And why? Because money is directly to unemployment, and you may see here how this it's very well figure out. Unemployment. Unemployment, alcohol consumption, smoking, a lot of risk factors which might be associated also with the transmission of the viruses in the population. If we add to this the campaign against the vaccination, it's something terrible which is going to happen at this beginning of century. And we have to interfere with this uh, unbelievable campaign against the uh, vaccination. Still in Europe, yes, we are still in Europe, and uh, we still have problems from the sanitation point of view. And we are looking in this area, we see between 1990 and 2008, not big deal was made it in this particular sector, hygiene. So it's another opportunity to convince the politicians that sanitation is one of the important issues in prolonged the lifespan of the people. If we like to have healthy people, then sanitation is the issue. If we don't have this, what do we have? We have acute hepatitis, yes, and this acute hepatitis is very well represented in especially red spots. But if we have acute hepatitis, obviously we have also chronic hepatitis B because we know that the important percentage of those who develop acute hepatitis remain uh, carriers for hepatitis B virus. And they are candidates for chronic hepatitis B, for cirrhosis, and of course, for hepatocarcinoma. And it's no any difference between male and female. With some exceptions here, you see a report in which uh, the France is supposed to be under um, um, estimated this uh, percentage and arrived to 85% of non-informed about new infections of, of hepatitis B. And here we have a problem because many countries report according to the origin of the patient. So if the patient is born in Africa, they allocate it. 
the risk of hepatitis B to Africa, which is not fair because the hepatitis B, acute hepatitis B was developed on the territory of uh, Europe. According to the age, we have a slightly modification. And we see that this pyramid of age is represented clearly between 15 and 45 years old. So in this area, particular area, is the problems that reach acute hepatitis B and not only. If we go to chronic hepatitis B, we see the same things, the same things with the chronic hepatitis B around this um, age. This means that uh, we have to face a new epidemiologic aspect. If in hepatitis C we have a window of 30 years of evolution of the chronic infections in hepatitis B, this window is much more reduced. And what we're gonna do we're going to do uh, to pay attention how we get infections with hepatitis B in this beginning of century. It's not very different from the last century, but we still have what heterosexual transmission. Yeah? We have mother to child transmission. We have tattoo piercing. Yeah? And we have nosocomial, which is tremendous. These lights make me be afraid. Nosocomial transmission at the beginning of this century is not acceptable because we have all the necessary tools to prevent this kind of episode. But this was reported. So from this particular uh, slide, I think that we have to review our activity in our particular place. Which are the trends? Of course, if we deplete the acute hepatitis, of course, we have to pay attention to the chronic hepatitis. If we have a patient with chronic hepatitis, we have to treat it immediately. Doesn't matter how we treat. We may use interferon therapy, or we may use uh, entecavir, or tenofovir, or whatever you wish to use it, but just use it. Because a patient which is undetectable, the chance of transmission of the virus has diminished considerable. In the same time, we keep the evolution under control, and it's less fibrosis, less evolution to the chronic, hepatitis, less cirrhosis, and of course, if it's treated for the early beginning, it's less hepatocarcinoma. We had an analysis between 89 and 2005 in Romania. I just added some slides from Romania because uh, I don't like somebody to be upset against me using the data for other countries. And what we saw, we saw that after that we introduced the vaccination with a good coverage, more than 80%, average 90%, we diminished considerable also the acute and obviously the chronic hepatitis B. We still have to worry because in this very moment, unfortunately, the coverage for vaccination in Romania started to decrease exactly due to the social media, to the Facebook, to the Twitter, to whatever you wish uh, to have as an instrument. So generally speaking, between 2000 and 2009, everything decreased considerable and was maintaining this situation. But an issue connected with hepatitis B came up, genotypes. Are all the genotypes the same? The answer is obviously no. Not all the genotypes are the same. Each genotype has different particularity. And we know exactly where they are. In Europe, we have A, we have G, we have H, we have D. So we have a lot of genotypes in a small number of countries. But if you're looking carefully, I think that we may split it in Europe in three particular areas. One area represented by Mediterranean basin, Greece, Italy, Spain. Another, Eastern Europe, with a mixture of A and D. And another one, Eastern Europe, with A in Czech Republic, Poland, with D in Russia, Croatia, and uh, Romania. So we have this pattern, then we may think how these patients will evolve with their own hepatitis B infections. Genotypes matter? Yes, matter. Here you see the endemicity, it's low in the western part. The mode of transmission is horizontal mostly throughout sexual and percutaneous routes. Age of the infection, adolescent and adults. Chronicity low between one and five percent. Family history often none. And of course dominant type A2 and respectively uh, D. So we have A2 mainly, D1 uh, and uh, hepatitis uh, G in France and Germany. So those genotypes, what are they gonna do? 
A and B have better response to interferon therapy. This is a good news. Because otherwise, um, if we use interferon therapy, we may give, uh, give the, to the patient a window opportunity to remain stable for a uh, few years. In the same time, genotype D, yeah, which is almost like in Romania, was found to be associated with more severe liver disease and hepatocarcinoma. Probably this is a reason why in Romania we have a lot of hepatocarcinoma in patients affected by hepatitis B. More than 50% of hepatitis B-related hepatocarcinoma are with genotype B. Younger patients with hepatitis, uh, hepatocarcinoma had hepatitis uh, B genotype, and the things may go on on this direction. So from this point of view, I think that we have to go back to the clinicians and to see if we have any clinical association possible. Yes, we have. You see the progression to the chronicity and the histologic inflammation for A genotype and for D genotype, very well represented. If we go further and we are going to the fibrosis and the association with adverse liver diseases, the D genotype is more relevant than the A genotype that we have in Europe. And if we get to the clearance of um, hepatitis B surface antigen and the response to interferon therapy, we see that the A is better than the D. So in this context, it's the context in which we have to look to our patient uh, from this perspective. The risk of chronicity, yes, it exists of chronicity, and this risk of chronicity is connected to genotype A, which is B to have a high risk of progression to chronicity, but in the same time in the Asian cohort patients, genotype C2 was independently associated with the progression to chronicity compared with the genotype D. In acute hepatitis infection, genotype D appeared to be connected with the acute liver failure. So, these are the data that we have to face in our situation. Immunologic aspects are very important, yes. Immunologic phase tolerance duration, you see in Western usually absent. If we go further, we see that the seroconversion in E system, it's common in hepatitis B genotype A2 and D, and of course, if we go further and to go to uh, see the rare infections and the relaunch of the disease, we see that it's high and very high in Mediterranean area. We put all data together, we see that we have three particular areas in Europe and we have the response how we have to pay attention to those patients. Well, the seroconversion in E and the S system. It's depending on the genotype. Yes, it's depending on the genotype, and each genotype reacts differently. So from this perspective, we don't have a specific answer in this very moment, but we know very well that uh, this uh, hepatitis uh, E antigen seroconversion, if we use a 75% uh, percentile, is between 24 and 58, according to the different uh, genotype. It's the reason why we have to gain all the data for the early beginning, and now we may emphasize which is supposed to be the evolution of the patient in the coming uh, period of time. Another issue is the hepatitis B DNA viral load. And right now you know that it's an important debate between the viral load and the determination quantit quantitative hepatitis B surface uh, antigen. Even in the situation there are differences between the different genotypes. Genotype C has been reported to have significantly higher viral load than the genotype B. The viral in genotype D has also been shown to be significantly higher than the type A, so it's exactly what we have in Europe in this uh, very uh, moment. And of course, this is connectious, connected with the perinatal infection and infants from infected mother, and mainly in the genotype E. Cirrhosis and hepatocarcinoma, it's also connected with the genotype? Yes, it's connected, and if we are looking here, we have the risk of cirrhosis, which is four times higher in E, uh, hepatitis B antigen positive, and it's almost 10 times higher in E negative uh, chronic hepatitis B. So it's an important difference in the perspective of the patient according to the E, uh, system. 
the same time, the risk of hepatocarcinoma is also relative uh, lower in A2 and D, and it's correlated with the older person, despite the fact that in Africa it's totally opposite. The younger people are affected by hepatocarcinoma, and of course, it's in correlations with A1, E, and D. From this point of view, heavy epidemiology data in genotype is linked to the uh, therapy response. And we know this because when you are treated with interferon for the early beginning, we see that it's a good response in Europe. And in the same time, we have a problem with the appearance of the natural mutations. So if we have this, we have to screen those patients for the early beginning and to have a full pattern of the type of the infections for each particular patient. In a such situation, we may summarize and we may say that in Europe we have a 2, we have a D, and it's according to those triple regions that I mentioned to you uh, previously. Can we do something? Of course, we can administer vaccine. We have a rapid regimen, 0-1-2, where we have a prolonged regimen, 0-1-6, but the problem is to gain more than 10 international units antibody against this patient. Who's supposed to be uh, vaccinated? In my opinion, everybody's supposed to be vaccinated because it's the unique method to prevent the infection of Hep B and, of course, the progression to the diseases. For this, we elaborated a lot of um, uh, national programs of vaccination. Each country practically has the scheme of uh, vaccinations according to the local policy. And of course, we have to vaccinate one or two years old, and of course, 10 to 15. In a such context, if we do not do it, we will have the same result that you may see here. But the problem is that a lot of patients has no idea to be infected about hepatitis B. In a such context, hepatitis B remain a public health problem. Thank you very much for your attention.